The following program contains shockingly brilliant insights. If you suffer from a lack of dark sunglasses, Randall may not be right for you. Check with your optometrist. Proclaiming the truth in the highways and byways of the world. Fighting for justice in the dark alleys of politics. Raising the voice of resistance to a fevered pitch. And he knows where to find the best and worst jail food in America. Randall Terry. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Randall Terry, the voice of resistance. It is I, your servant, Randall. Today, will Obama face an insurrection from the left? And QE 3, 4, 5, and 6, what will happen to the price of gold? We've got our interview with Stephen Dace and some comedy. All of this on one half hour program? How do we do it? I don't even know. Today's program brought to you in part by the Federal Reserve and QE3, four, five, and six. Hey, if you're gonna print money, why stop now? And by Quicksand. Hey, if you're gonna drown in mud, let's get it over with quickly. I'll be right back after a quick word from one of my friends. I have to admit, there are times that I wish I was on the outside. Then, of course, there are other times when I think to myself, I'm safer in here than I am out there. Got crazy people like Charlie Sheen threatening to kill people. What is that? Anyway, while I'm here, I get to watch a lot of television. So in addition to Law and Order reruns, I do watch a lot of news, usually Fox. I can't stand those destaduras over at CNN and NBC, whatever. They make me crazy. I've come to the conclusion that this nation is being run usually by criminals. And I mean that with precision. And so I thought to myself, if these wise guys, these crackpots, can run our government, why not me? And so I've decided to offer my name for the United States Senate for 2012. Now you may say, Mr. Hammer, how could you as a convicted felon possibly run for office? It is a valid question to which I say this. The difference between me and these other destaduras that are in office right now is that I got my jail time out of the way before I got elected. Vote for Joey the Hammer. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the program. Today is a day for conversions. So we're going to open up the altar. You're going to come forward. And if you believe, no, not that kind of a conversion, a conversion to the truths that you say you believe. I remember when I had my conversion. It was the mid-1990s. I was listening to a friend who was saying that, well, frankly, that people on welfare, if they can't find food, he, and this is, and I quote, let them die. And all I could think of was Scrooge. And the angels were not happy with Scrooge. So his presentation did not bless me. And frankly, it did not convert me. But later on, I remember listening to people who spoke calmly and with compassion from the scriptures concerning God's love for the poor and how the poor are to be cared for. Randall. What are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about President Obama meeting right now with the leaders of both houses from both parties. That means Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner are hanging out with President Obama in the White House, along with Mitch McConnell and, yes, Harry Reid. They're all having a big powwow about three basic things. Number one, raising the debt ceiling. Number two, raising taxes. And number three, dealing with entitlements. And specifically, they're talking about Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Now, this is the frame in which I'm going to work today. Set that aside for one minute, and let me read to you a quote from Abraham Lincoln and from the Holy Bible. Abraham Lincoln said, it may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. 
He said that in his second inaugural address. He was talking about the fact that both the South and the North were praying that they could have victory in the war between the states. The Civil War, for those of you in the North, and the War of Northern Aggression, those of you in the South. And he was basically framing the entire argument in a Christocentric, Bible-centered view of the war itself. And that passage that I just quoted from his second inaugural was actually an allusion to the book of Genesis, where God spoke these words to Adam. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to the dust you shall return. What happened with Adam and Eve, the fall, resulted in God saying to them, by the sweat of your face you will eat bread. Abraham Lincoln said, it may seem strange that somebody would pray that they could wring their bread from the sweat of another man's face. In other words, the curse that God gave Adam and Eve was severe, but the curse of American slavery was more severe because people wanted to earn their daily bread from the sweat of another man's face. And my friend, that is the essence of slavery. When another man works against his will for your bread, for your care, a business transaction where someone works, earns money, buys something, where someone works for you, where you make investments even in a company and that company does well and you prosper or that company does poorly and perhaps you lose everything. That's all about freedom. That's not about wringing your bread from the sweat of another man's face. But slavery, the essence of slavery is that someone is compelled to work for you against their will or because of the will of someone else, a majority even. They work for you so that you can have your daily bread. Now, let's assume that there was a little, there was a little town and there were 100 people in the town and you were really wealthy. And those 100 people got together and said, we're working hard, we're eating, We've got our own little plots, but that guy up on the hill with that big house, he's got a lot of food. Let's take a vote. Let's vote to take half his food to feed us so that we don't have to work for a year. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. Through a democratic process, we have voted to take that man's wealth and to force him to work for our bread. Well, he already did work and we're just taking what he earned. Friend, that man who worked hard, earned what he got ethically, that man, through a majority vote, is now becoming enslaved. So whether slavery happens because someone is kidnapped from Africa and brought here, or somebody has a gun to a person's head, or through a majority vote, the essence of slavery remains the same that you are compelled to work for the benefit of another against your will. Now, I've got to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to talk about raising the debt limit, cutting entitlements, and raising taxes, what's happening right now, in the light of the words of Abraham Lincoln and the curse that God put on Adam and Eve. And hopefully you'll see how it all comes together and perhaps you'll have a conversion. I want to say one more thing. It's not just about what you believe. It's about what you believe, what you're willing to say, and what you're willing to do. I'll be right back. Randall and I made a trip to Mars as part of a secret project. Okay, I lied. It was actually to the moon with Neil Armstrong. moments with Moses and for those of you that are left I will send faintness into their hearts in the lands of their enemies the sound of a driven leaf shall put them to flat and they shall flee as one flees from the sword and they shall fall when none pursues
Friend, welcome back to the program. The essence of the debate that's going on in Washington, D.C. right now is whether or not the government has the right to put a gun to your head and compel you to work by the sweat of your face for another man's bread. Or, let me say it like this, for those of you that are on entitlements, the debate before you is whether or not you have the right, through a majority vote, to compel your neighbor to work by the sweat of his face for your daily bread, and whether or not you're willing to take it. Now, I'm going to tell you that I had a conversion in the mid to late 90s when I realized that we were, in fact, a socialist ma nation by, by at least many definitions. We had two small foster children that we ended up adopting, and the government gave us money every month to care for these children. The last five months, I said to the government, I'm not taking your, any, your money anymore. When we adopted the children, the government said to us, we will give you money for the rest of their minority until they reach 18 because they're hard to place children. And we said, we're not taking your money. It's not fair for us to compel our neighbor to provide for our children's daily bread. When the cash for clunkers came along, I said, I've got a car in my driveway with a blown motor, but you want me to make my neighbor pay for my car? When my wife and I lost our home, we had the chance to get in on Obama's government bailout of mortgages. And we said, you mean you want us to force our neighbor to pay for our mortgage? The reason I'm telling you this is because once upon a time, I was a victim of government education. I was a victim of socialist propaganda, including the propaganda that comes from Republicans. And it took me time to think through what freedom really meant, what the biblical standard for the care of the poor really was. And once I had my conversion, number one, it became a part of what I believe. But this is what I want to talk to you about. It's not just what you believe. It's what are you willing to say and what are you willing to do? If you believe that the government does not have the right to compel you to give to Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, food stamps, WIC, that's step one. Step two is, are you willing to say it publicly? Are you willing to say, I care about the poor? Jesus loves the poor. But Jesus does not give the authority to the government, as Abraham Lincoln said, to force us to wring the bread that they eat out of the sweat of our faces. The government doesn't have that right. And then thirdly, what are you willing to do? It's one thing to talk about these things online, on TV, with the company of our friends. It's another thing to fight publicly, to have your vote reflect your ethics, to have your political aspirations and who you work for and who you give money to in a campaign reflect what you believe and what you say. This country is drowning in debt and it is entitlements that have done it. And we've got Democrats and Republicans alike saying we've got to preserve all these entitlements and we've got to figure out a way to fund it. And what are they doing? They're drowning us in a sea of debt and they are enslaving not only us, but our children to this debt. And it's all about entitlements. We need people to have the courage to step forward and say, this is all immoral because it's all slavery. I'm gonna take a quick break, but before I do, let's close out this segment with a little comedy on QE3, qualitative easement, where the government loans money by printing money and pays back fake money with more fake money. I don't even understand it, do you? I introduce you to QE3. <laughs> Now this here race is about QE1, 2, and 3. Will the dollar make it through QE3? There's a lot of people that think it's gonna get bogged down in that third mud pit. Let's watch and see.
QE3. man is called a reactionary if he objects to having his property stolen and his wife and children murdered. Sir Winston Churchill. There is a coming ash heap. There's rubble coming. And one of the key questions is, who will emerge from the rubble? If you look at the history of nations, when the Roman Empire collapsed, it was the church that was standing on the rubble. Mm -hmm. When the German Empire collapsed, it was Hitler that was standing on the rubble. So we're going to have cataclysm, internal cataclysm as a nation. When the dollar finally collapses and we are scrambling to survive and our cities turn to ash heaps because there's riots, because our Christian premise is gone, when all these things begin to unravel and it's, you read Leviticus 26, read Le um, uh, Deuteronomy 28 and you see it played out, there's going to be one last window and it's going to be who stands on the ash heap. Mm -hmm. And right now, if an ash heap came, we would all be in chains and we would have an Adolf Hitler-like demagogue as our leader because that's what we're all prepared for. We had better get our act together because judgment is here, judgment is coming, and somebody's going to have to lead us out on the other side of this mess. And it's either going to be good guys or bad guys. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I, just, I, I just, if anybody that's watching this, whatever, please, whatever lie you're being told, that we, need, that we didn't get here in a day, and it takes incremental steps and little by little. Yet it, we won't get out of a hole we, that we dug ourselves in in one fell swoop, but we haven't taken any incremental steps at all. We're, go, we're stepping backwards. We're taking the premise of the other team and yes. saying, let's just regulate evil. God does not want to regulate evil. He wants to eradicate it. That's yes. the ultimate message of his son, okay? Which is, hey, this ash sheep th that you just mentioned, the evil you're looking at in your culture, you know, he pointed to his apostles at Caesarea Philippi and he said, you know what, even over there, the most evil, decadent place where they're worshiping Pan and doing terrible things, I'm gonna build my church even on top of that. We are here, it's like the old sizzling bacon commercials when I was a kid, move over bacon, now there's something meatier. This is what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be. It's God's road grader over the evil, filth, depravity of the enemy. We replace bad cultures with renewed, one, renewed ones, we replace sinners with saints. It's an agent of transformation. And it hasn't been an agent of transformation for several generations now. And the ramifications for that are all over every Drudge Report headline that you go and look at nowadays. By the way, if you don't know who this man is, neither do I. What's your name again, sir? Uh, Steve. Your last name? Uh, Dace. It doesn't spell the way it sounds. No, we've been wrong for centuries, so. Go, you see the name online, go to his website. He is a key player here in Iowa. By the way, speaking of key players in Iowa, and uh, we're not regulating death, talk about the debacle that happened here with Kim Pearson. We had three freshman state legislators, all of them friends of mine, uh, Kim Pearson, Tom Shaw, Glenn Massey, stand up and say to their 60-seat Republican majority, hey, you know, before we start compromising the principle of right to life, how about we actually assert it? I mean, why would you surrender a war up front? I, I used to kid on the air that the Republican Party motto in America is surrender now before it's too late, okay? And, and so how about we actually try to The Republicans the right commit, commit suicide on the installment plan. Exactly it's much right. more fun. And, and their own caucus opposed them. They had to force a vote. This is one of the huge, this was a personhood amendment yes. type thing. Yeah, it was, a, it was a bill that simply said a human being is a human being at the moment of conception, therefore is entitled to all the protections that every other person gets in the law. And, you, and that's the very Wow, that's a novel thought. Yeah, it's also the very first plank in the Republican Party of Iowa platform. So, of course, the pro-life party was so anxious to advance that and shove that right down the Democrats' throat, right? Not so much. No, and they ended up fighting their own caucus because of that. And I think there's a real lesson learned there that I hope the next generation picks up on as well. Wait, but I want to talk. There's something else that's more important. Those legislators, the House Speaker, et cetera, who say they're pro-life and then yep. killed the bill. Yep. They were fueled, funded, manned with volunteers by these various so-called pro-life groups yeah. who are not pro-life. 
They are yeah. treacherous. And talk about the pro-life groups yes. that actually betrayed this. Name names, tell me who they were, what well, happened. And I will just say this, I had private conversations. I kept trying to ask the director of Iowa Right to Life privately, and my pastor was on their board fighting them while they were doing this and just asking a simple question. Can you just show me where in the Bible it says that we are allowed to trip over dollars to pick up dimes where human life is concerned? Just tell me where this is at. If you can tell me scripturally that we are allowed to do what you are trying to do here, then by all, I'll give up the argument and say, hey, you know what? I'll submit to God's authority. They, they could never give me any of arguments. Of course not. And not only that, they wouldn't even take a position. The Iowa Christian Alliance, Iowa Faith and Freedom Coalition, uh, Iowa Right to Life, those groups here in our state would Say not, those three names again. Iowa Christian Alliance, which, by the way, is run by a Republican National Committeeman in our state, Iowa Faith and Freedom Coalition and Iowa Right to Life would not take a stand on life at conception at all. Well, they work behind the scenes against it, and though. They, and I was going to add that. And behind the scenes, they were actually working against it, yes. Right, so I want you to remember those three names. You see them on the screen. This is the tip of the iceberg. Thank you, Stephen. I'll be right back with a word from Abraham Lincoln. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. Abraham Lincoln said, it may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. Christian, beware. Beware lest you be caught up in this horrifying socialist entitlement net and that you would dare to pray that God would wring your daily bread from the sweat of other men's faces.